Hey, good day, everyone, and welcome to topic four in our database design and management class. In this topic, we're going to focus on data modeling and the entity relationship model. Let's get started. In this first video, part one of topic four, I'm going to discuss the stages of database development. And again, these are things that don't occur in isolation, but shall we keep in mind that we're developing databases, typically in some sort of organizational context for the purpose of solving some kind of organizational data problem. And as we can see, there are at least three major stages of database development. They generally proceed in sequence, but not always. So usually what we'll do is we'll start off with requirements analysis. And this is the information gathering phase of the broader database development process. So what we're doing here is we're trying to learn about the data needs that the organization has as reflected in its, a lot of its work artifacts, right? So again, we might look at things like existing reports that are generated. So those reports, the, the content of the report needs to come from a database. So if, if a manager or a executives, they need particular information summarized in a report format, then we need to ensure that we have that information available and stored in our database. Similarly, we might look at things like, I don't know, user interface forms, right? If we have apps like mobile apps or a web app or something like that. Because when we're gathering information, say we I don't know if we're like an, an e-tailer, right? Some online retailer, and we're asking customers to provide us with their mailing address information that would be input or edited on say some kind of web form, but on the back end, it has to go and be stored in a database somewhere. So again, this is another good source of requirements. And as we'll see momentarily, there are lots and lots of other sources. However, generally the process proceeds as once we're done with requirements analysis, we can move into design and the component design stage is the stage of the broader database development process in which we take what we've learned about the underlying data problem and the data requirements that the organization has. And uh, we attempt to translate those into a fully normalized entity relationship model. That is we design a database and as We'll learn here, we'll use the entity relationship modeling tools to accomplish that, but the possibility exists for some iteration here between steps one and two. So uh, if we find ourselves here in step two and we're working on designing the database and we just don't have enough information to decide how to do something, or we find ourselves having to make an assumption then we can iterate. So we may decide that, hey, we don't quite have enough information. So let's go back and go back to requirements analysis and see if we can learn a little bit more about whatever it is we're struggling with during our design process. And uh, we can talk to additional people, try to find additional information, whatever it may be that will allow us to resolve our uncertainty. And uh, once we have that information, we can then go back and continue our design activities. So we can iterate here a little bit, but if we do a really good job in requirements analysis, that sort of iteration should be minimal. And right? if we go out and we think about it, like if you're building a house, right? So if you do a great job up front of planning, measuring, planning, calculating your materials and your labor costs and all the various things that you'll need in order to build the house, then the actual design work should be relatively straightforward. Right. Once you learn exactly what to say a particular homeowner wants their house to be, then you can go and design it without encountering too many problems. However, if you do a poor job in requirements analysis, then it may be necessary to go and in, in this little analogy, talk to the homeowner again, say, Hey, what color did you want to the tile in your bathroom to be? Or, or what color did you want me to paint the walls in the bedrooms? So if you didn't gather that information early on, you're going to have to go and ask them again before you can complete your design process. So exactly the same scenario applies with databases, right? If we can do a really good job here, then we only have to do it once, but if we're down here in design and we find that we 
forgot something or we don't have enough information to fully design the database, then we may need to revisit requirements analysis to complete our knowledge of what is truly needed. So once that's done, the output here of our component design stage is a database design. And typically that will take the form of an ERD, Entity Relationship Diagram. So that's our output. And uh, this is a graphical design of the entire database. And it's a diagram. So it's, it's an illustration. And the symbols that we use in that diagram convey information about the structure and intended design of the database. So a skilled database developer then can take that entity relationship diagram and easily implement it here in stage three. So once we've completed component design, we have an ERD and that ERD then becomes input into stage three of our broader database development process. And this is where we actually build the database. Okay. So the implementation, implementation stage is building the database. So you would go, for example, into SQL Server Management Studio and implement the design that is shown in the ERD. So that's a set of skills in and in of itself. It's not enough just to be able to design something, but so we can take those designs and implement them. One thing that I will note that is an interesting reality in the world of database design is that just like with the structured query language, as long as we focus on the core of entity relationship design, the output or can be used as input into any type of enterprise level database. That is, we don't necessarily, we're not designing for a specific product or a specific database made by a particular vendor, right? We're not designing a database to be implemented in SQL Server or Oracle or MySQL or DB2, whatever it may be, right? We're designing a general solution. And then because these various enterprise level database products all follow the same guidelines, that is they implement the entity relationship model, right? They have their relational databases. We can then take that ERD and implement it in any database product that we like. So you can get a design from a database designer and build that design in SQL server, or you can build it in Oracle, or you can build it in DB2 or MySQL, any other sort of enterprise level database product that your company happens to be using. So it's just like SQL. As long as you study the standard version of SQL, then you can work immediately with any sort of enterprise level database, very small learning curve. All right. So let's take a look at requirements analysis in a little more detail. Again, the idea here is to gather information and or the information that we're gathering is all about, you know, what we need to solve some kind of organizational data problem. Keep in mind that databases, these enterprise level databases support companies and other organizations in several ways, right? They not only keep track of the organization's data, but they facilitate the work tasks that the employees do on a day-to-day -day basis. If you're interacting with any sort of information system, be it on a tablet or a desktop or maybe on your phone, it is almost certainly going to have some sort of data layer to it. And more often than not in organizations, that will be a relational database. Okay. So this means that that relational database needs to have the ability to store and organize information that can be used by lots and lots of different people and types of people, groups of people in organizations to carry out their daily work tasks. So if we want to know then what people need in terms of data in order to do their jobs, one way that we can get that information is to talk to them. Instead of guessing, instead of making assumptions, assuming that we as database designers know exactly what people need in the products that we provide to them, we can talk to them and get them involved in the process and ask them what they think, ask them to explain how they do their jobs and so on. Okay. So this is a a good source of information, talk to people. Don't make the mistake that was so common in the computer software world for several decades, where the software designer thinks that they know precisely how software should be designed. And this was a, a great impediment 
to the progress of the information age, the age of computation, because we had these software designers out there thinking that they knew better than the actual workers how to design software that would allow those workers to do their jobs. So you would have these giant messes of like, maybe you're making software for the people that work at a bank and you don't actually talk to them and you just go and build it and say, here's how it is. And you're going to have to learn to adapt to it. It's a much, much better, smoother process. If you can actually get the people involved early on and then really build a product that will suit them and meet their needs. Same thing applies here with database designs. Other sources of requirements include lots of existing IT artifacts, right? We can look at forms as I was describing earlier. These could be like data input forms on, I don't know, maybe your company's website or on a mobile device, or maybe you have some standalone desktop software that the company uses. So these are great sources of requirements for database design as well. So are existing reports, right? So maybe we have, I don't know, like exception reports that we might generate on an unusual basis. Show me all the people that didn't come to work today when they were supposed to. So something unusual has happened, or this could be periodic reports. So maybe once every week we generate a end of week sales summary for the manager of the sales department. Okay, so, but the information that is displayed or conveyed on those reports will likely come from the database. And that means by looking at the reports, we can reverse engineer them to figure out what data needs to be stored in the database so that these reports can be generated. Another great source is to look at existing queries. So you can look, for example, at what are people asking the database to answer? Maybe they're writing uh, queries using SQL select statements. Maybe you're looking at queries that are embedded inside existing software programs. Okay, so remember, it's not just human beings that use SQL queries to communicate with a relational database. Indeed, our software programs be they mobile apps or data-driven web apps or desktop application, are communicating their desires, their intentions, their needs to the database by using SQL statements as well. So it's not just humans that are sending SQL statements to the database, our software programs do also. And that means there will be embedded queries in many software programs that we can use as a source of requirements when we're working on database design. Another is use cases or user stories, the evolution of this old idea of use cases from the unified modeling language, where basically we have a story that tells what a particular user of the system needs to do. And this kind of comes out of software design where it's very data reliant. So there can be information in here about the data needs of the various actors as they interact with an information system as well. We can use that as input into our requirements analysis. Company business rules, right? These are just policies, right? Decisions that have been made about how a company will operate. The example I gave earlier is, do we require employees to work in departments or not, right? That's a business rule. Somebody made that choice. Other types of business rules might be things like, I don't know, how often do we have to change our passwords, right? So that sort of thing can be embedded into the database design as well. But the point is that if we have knowledge of these business rules, we can ensure that the database design that we create will support, or in many cases, automatically enforce those business rules, thus preventing them from being broken. Finally, we can look at observation and the JAD sessions. Observation, this one is creepy because uh, you're literally watching somebody do their job and most of us don't feel comfortable or would not feel comfortable with, I don't know, someone standing behind us and just watching what we do all day. But there are other less intrusive ways of gathering information through observation. Crux of the reason that observation is used is it's well established that people often behave differently than they say they do. So if you just sit down and I don't know, in the case of a user interview, and you ask somebody how they do their job, well, they may have an explanation for you, but it may not be a complete picture or a fully accurate representation of how they actually do their work. And if you were to observe them, you would find that maybe a little nuanced things come up here and there and they have to behave differently. Or maybe they were prevaricating in their user interviews in order to conceal some information. Maybe they want people to think that the work that they're doing is 
more time consuming than it genuinely is. And uh, they don't want that to be revealed because that would show them to be inefficient. Nevertheless, we can identify those things using observation, right? So you could say, this person told me that they spend half an hour a day doing data cleaning on this, but it turns out they only spend 10 minutes doing it. And again, there are unobtrusive ways of doing observation. If people feel socially awkward about being watched, one, for example, is to, with the employee's permission, as to uh, set up a camera and uh, make it in a, not to where it's overwhelmingly obvious or noticeable, but just so that you want them to know that it's there, but that you don't want them to be distracted by it. And in this way, you can observe them work more in their natural environment. It's almost, I don't know, watching animals in their natural environment on camera versus if you're right there, it might influence their behavior. All right. And our final one are these JAD sessions. This is joint application development, and it's a common practice. So I'll just write this out here so we can all see it. So this is joint application development. And the basic idea here is that we want to get all of the various stakeholders for the information system together in one room and uh, talk about it. See if we can flesh out some of the uh, details, achieve consensus or agreement among stakeholders about what the new system should do. And uh, from that, we can gather a lot of knowledge about the underlying data requirements that will be necessary to support the features and functions that have been identified during the joint application development process. So again, the idea with these is, hey, let's get, let's not just talk to users, but maybe we talk to customers and managers and external stakeholders and programmers and database designers. We get them all together in the same room to try to build some kind of consensus or shared understanding of the problem that's trying to be solved. And once you have that, it's great because it gets people involved. They feel more attached to the overall process and any sort of conflicts or incongruities in people's understanding of the underlying data problem can be readily identified and sorted out right there so that we don't have to revisit the requirements analysis phase later. So lots and lots of sources. This is, of course, is not an exhaustive list, but it should at least give you some sense of, of the reality that there are lots of possible ways of finding information about data requirements. So once we have those requirements, we move on to the next stage in the broader design process. And uh, that is actually the component design stage where we're going to translate the requirements that we gathered during the requirements analysis phase into a database design. And that database design will take the form of an entity relationship or ER diagram or data model. Now in broad strokes, there is nothing that will be at least entirely unfamiliar about the main components that collectively are used to construct these entity relationship model. These are entities or tables. Okay, so we already have an idea about what that concept is. Attributes, right? The constituent columns that comprise an individual table. And we know that we can broadly classify attributes into two groups, identifiers or keys or regular non-key attributes, right? It's not a primary key, not a foreign key, just some regular attribute hanging out in there. And uh, we know that in the relational model, these tables or entities are interconnected to each other. So we have relationships as well. All of these various things are depicted in an entity relationship model. Now we've seen some database diagrams previously in our class. Entity relationship models, however, once we learn all of their various subtleties and capabilities, allow us to convey much more detailed information about the design of the data solution than can be conveyed using the sort of simple database diagramming tools that are provided, for example, inside SQL Server Management Studio. So although the main constituents are the same, tables, attributes, relationships, those are all the same, entity relationship modeling provides us with a set of tools that allow us to convey much more detailed or subtle information about the design. So I think we'll find that to be of interest as we proceed.